Hi, and welcome to Access Chat. Today, we're really pleased to have Dina Moti with us. Very excited that Dina's um, work in education, bringing on the next generation of people that are going to be nurturing uh, people with uh, accessibility needs. So, Dina, welcome. Um, very pleased to have you with us. I know you've joined us a number of times for the, the Twitter chat, and it's great to have your support, and it's great to have you with us here today. So can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be working in accessibility? Because we all have a, a story as how we ended up in this in this arena. Um, so it uh, really started after graduating from university and uh, I had done a lot of workshops on accessibility and inclusive practices and, and what have you. And then uh, I, joined, I joined a school which um, as a grade four teacher and uh, and it was quite an interesting experience because uh, as I was mentioning before it was uh, the reality of uh, theory versus practice and uh, that really enforced my passion for inclusion and I um, uh, started learning some more, did my master's in education um, with a focus on subject area option and um, and a couple of special ed courses, and then I transitioned slowly into my role as a as a prof in the educational support program. Um, personally speaking, I I think accessibility ties in with inclusivity, and um, I'm all from a different background, and uh, to me they kind of go hand in hand, right? Because you um, you have to create an accessible, inclusive word in order to uh, to make a difference. Okay. Absolutely, I'm, I'm with you all the way. Accessibility is only one part of the the overall diversity and inclusion agenda. Obviously, it's a technic more technical um, to a large extent than than some of the other areas, but it's it's only part of a bigger picture. Totally agree with you. So. Um, I know when we've been talking offline, you were talking about um, the school system in, in Canada and how there is support, um, but there is a drop off. Um, and, 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 and in the UK, we were talking about it being sort of almost completely reversed. But t tell us a bit about that and, and, and your experiences of how you're preparing people to, 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 to make, make the transition to higher education. Um, so, uh, as I was mentioning before, that uh, in Canada we've got the K through 12 system, which provides students with disabilities with a lot of services and, and access to uh, specialized instruction, assistive technology, and what have you. Uh, but our students are, um, they're not advocating for themselves. You've got the parents, you've got the special ed teachers, and you've got the system in a way that's advocating for them and for their needs. And then they uh, go into post-secondary and there's a gap. There's a gap there um, where transition is is not really enforced in a way where, you know what, right now you need to advocate for, for yourself. There's a lot of grants and, uh, and awards and support services for students with disabilities, but not all of the students know about that. And in Canada, there has been um, a better focus, if you want to call it, on transition programs, on prepping students. So as I tell my students in the educational assistant program, um, the end goal is really for students with disabilities to be interdependent. We don't want them to be independent. We don't want them to go to the system and be on their own and then it's a sink or swim mode. We want them to be inter interdependent in a way where when they know they need help, they go and access the help. And um, our goal as educators is really not to advocate for, their, for our students, but rather teach them how to advocate for themselves, to be self-advocates. Um, so that's my experience with the Canadian system and how I kind of tie in, tie in the um, both. Okay. One of, one of the things that came up on, on a couple of our previous chats, both with David Leposky and, and with Billy Boudreau, was the fact that each individual state has its own accessibility laws. So um, does that also flow through to differences in states in, in the education system as well with that accessibility in education? For sure. So uh, in Canada, we've got special bursaries for, uh, sorry, in Ontario, we've got special bursaries uh, for students with disabilities. 
I'm um, not aware of the different programs uh, that they have in different uh, provinces, but there are some differences in, in funding, but I'm not aware of the specific amount of funds and programs. Every province has its own programs, but the names differ and uh, the application and the amount of funding and, and services available. But you are right, yes, it does differ from one province to another. Okay. It's, it's quite interesting that um, one of the things that I found was support is patchy uh, and and universities had an environment where it was within their interest it was definitely in their interest to help students come forward about their disabilities and to give them help because actually the way that the, it was set up in in the uk funding is based on league tables and exam success and everything else so um the universities quite quickly cotton on to the fact that if they didn't help these students, they were likely to be losing out on additional funding because they weren't hitting the results, um, which has had the knock-on effect of universities and, and higher education in general being actually a very disability-friendly place mm -hmm. with, in, in the UK because even as you put in your application, you're already asked whether or not you, you, um, you have a disability and your... Um, application form actually almost automatically triggers the process for the disabled student allowance grant which okay. triggers everything else off uh, which is fantastic but then we get the drop off um, when people transition into work mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah and that's that's another challenge so so you, what you're saying right now makes more sense to me in terms of how students are supported in the UK because in Canada um, on your application you do not uh, identify that you do have a disability, you actually have to go to the accessibility offices in uh, the university or at the college and then self-identify and say, you know, I, I've got a diagnosed disability and I'm trying to access the services. So it's not on the application form. And um, when I worked as an accessible um, advisor, at uh, Sheridan College, um, oftentimes we would get messages from the people in the OTR, the Office of the Registrar, saying that, you know, we're receiving all those IEPs and we've got to shred them because of confidentiality, right? So students have to go and self-identify um, and tell the advisor that, you know, I'm trying to access help. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Deborah, I know you've got a question. Uh, are they applying <clears throat> online or... The, the, they they need to go and fill in everything in paper. How, how is the how can the, how, what's the process? So the process is they have to go to the Ontario website and then they apply. Uh, they put in one application, but they have uh, the option to apply for three different programs, different colleges and universities, and then based on the acceptance, they would uh, uh, they would go to the college or university and go through orientation and, uh, and self-identify. Here's the thing, there are a lot of orientation programs and uh, it, is, it is mentioned on the website, um, but then again, from my experience as an accessible learning advisor, you get students who say, who, who come in to you for help <clears throat> excuse me, midterm, and they said, we didn't know, right? We didn't know that these services are available. Or you would get faculty uh, coming in and saying, this student is really struggling, and based on a conversation I had with them, they said that they did receive extra help or support in, in high school, right? So it's really about navigating the system and, and going through loops to find that, yes, services are available and funding is available for bursaries and assistive technology and specialized services okay. and uh, as part of that when the students w when they are on the first year are sometimes they may have a disability that they never realize that they actually have so Absolutely. Uh, uh, what is what is done for how those students are being supported and uh, what resources are available in order to 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 go into that direction for sure. So um, when a student comes in and they say, or oftentimes it's really the faculty, they suspect that might have some learning differences, uh, then what uh, the Accessible Learning Services Office um, 
they do they do referrals. So they send students for psychoeducational assessments to assess their learning, if there are any discrepancies. And then based on that, if the psych ed assessment comes back with a learning disability um, or any kind of diagnosed disability, then they are referred to a learning strategist, assistive technologist, and an accommodation form is created. Uh, but in Canada, the student does have to um, have a, a diagnosed disability and for a psych ed assessment it needs to be updated because we all know that once uh, once a student with a disability is an adult then that learning disability is is lifelong right it's not going to change mm -hmm. yeah. Dina um, in, in the United States it, it sounds um, like there's a lot of similarities we we have a lot of we have a lot of support in our K through 12, and um, and not quite as much. We're working on it in our universities. Some of the universities are better at it than other universities, but um, I am, you know, it's still a work in progress in the United States. And since we are the United States, every single one of our states handles it differently. And sometimes within our states, it, well, always within our states. Um, the different cities and counties handle it differently. Just to where I'm, I'm located in central Virginia, and um, there are four major counties where I am, and they all are doing it differently. Some of them, some of them, anyway, we've got a lot of work to do in the U.S. But I'm curious if in the efforts that you're making, and I, I saw you, especially uh, you've been, you know, were, have been very gracious with your time on Access Chat, and I have seen some of your students join Access Chat, and you're very supportive of them, and, and uh, that always that really impresses me because we, it's so important to support and empower each other. But I am curious of after, you know, are y'all doing specific things once the students? Um, um, you know, they're they're navigating their way, hopefully, through college to help them move into the workforce. I'm just curious what you are doing um, with that. If and that might not be your focus. Yeah. Uh, so I don't I don't do that work anymore. But when I used to work with accessible learning, we did have a transition program uh, for students who were going to work, and it was absolutely amazing. The accessible learning um, services would put in a one day workshop where it was um, uh, trying to find jobs, how to go for an interview, whether to disclose your disability or not in the interview, and uh, a lot of um, a learning and, and coping strategies and a lot of advocacy skills because right. that's really where we need to do a lot of the work where students advocate for themselves and they talk about the disability um, in a way where it's not always oh, it going to hinder me right like how can I how can I provide um, strength for the organization that I'm going to be working on despite my disability or how can I, how can I turn my disability into an asset to the company uh, so that's what the accessible learning services uh, they do I don't do work with them anymore as a prof uh, but many of my students attend attend that well and, and Dina I think you bring up such a good point because one thing that you know as a parent of a child with um, Down syndrome it's it is always interesting uh, there as as I moved into this field to try to really you know be a one of the many voices of disability and inclusion accessibility. I, I had uh, experts telling me they didn't really want the parents in there because the parents won't let go. We cause problems, and you know we're not in some ways welcome. Which all of that is true. We do sometimes cause problems. Blah blah. But. The th I, I think the point that you made in that they have to know how to advocate. The parents have to know to advocate how to advocate for them. They have to know how to advocate. They have to know how. Um, and, and I'll go back to something that Neil did recently. Neil wrote, and maybe he can address it after I finish this point. But Neil, as a um, a successful man that you know has is dyslexic, he wrote um, a an opinion piece about almost coming out as a dyslexic. And I think one thing that we've got to do is we have to empower people to be who they are and at the same time tap into why, just picking on Neil, why is Neil a better director, a better leader because he has dyslexia? 
Mm -hmm. Why? Why is he? And why has that given him advantages maybe to somebody like me that didn't struggle with dyslexia? I had other struggles in my life because I think that's what it's about. But I think helping people understand how to advocate for themselves and how to show why their autism or the dyslexia or, or whatever it is, why it can add value in the workforce or in society as a whole. And Neil, I don't know if you want to jump in right there or give it to Dina. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll give it to Dina. Um, and then I'll, then, then I'll jump in. <laughs> Putting me on the spot. I see. Uh, you know what? I love the quotation that says a community that excludes one member is not a community at all. Right. And we live in a diverse community uh, that's full of different languages, different abilities and different cultures. And it's just rich and beautiful. And the thing is, to me, is um, because I come from a different background. Right. And, and I tell my students this story. I'm not diagnosed with a disability, but I was never able to do math. Never never able to do math. I did not like, and, and I should keep my voice down because my daughter is listening. Um, <laughs> I don't like math. I was never able to do math. But the thing is, I directed my strength somewhere else. I had a love for reading and writing. I had a love for education. I come from parents of, uh, from a family of educators. And I directed my energy there to use my strength to compensate for my challenge. I don't like the word weakness. Um, and I tell my students the same thing. Being different is unique, right? Every person has a certain challenge and every person has a, a certain strength. And um, we need to empower our students to find their strength in order to to give back to the community and in order to empower them and in order to uh, help them advocate and find their spot in the world. Um, and I want to go back to a point that Neil made about students transitioning. You talked about, um, I believe, the assessments in post-secondary. And here's the thing, a couple of uh, years ago, the rates for students who had autism, who were joining post-secondary, was just increasing. It was going up. It's not because students were uh, or individuals were, more individuals were diagnosed with autism, and maybe that's the case, but it's because we were more welcoming of, you know what, it's okay to have a disability. Come to, come to uh, colleges and university. We've got programs and we've got services to support you. So it was, um, it was not a stigma anymore, right? Sure. Where if you have a disability, you can't do it at, uh, at uh, the post-secondary. You have to go to, to work, right, into the workplace. Um, so uh, it's really about building a system and a community of practice that welcomes not just diversity, but um, differences and, and the strength of being okay. different. So that neatly uh, segues into what I wrote about. I wrote about neurodiversity and how people need to come out because actually the, the stigma that people on the neurodiverse spectrum or spectra, because it's multiple spectrums, feel is akin to how it was to, to be uh, lesbian, bisexual, gay, transgender uh, previously because you're not accepted by society. I don't, um, unlike with physical disabilities, there is the expectation that you're somehow stupid. Uh, and that's or really lazy. Not the case. Or la oh, well, yes, I was called yeah. a dilettante um, yes. and a daydreamer, um, which to a certain extent I agree with, but it doesn't make me stupid. Um, I chose, like you did, to focus my efforts on the things that interested me and that I was good at. Um, I'm also pretty bad at maths. Um, however, that has led me to um, invest my time investing uh, and investigating this calculia, um, which is a really fascinating topic, and, and working out ways that we can make the, the internet more accessible for people that don't like maths. Um, but I think that like the, the, the gay rights movement, actually people who are neurodiverse want to change society's perceptions and we need to do that collectively. And that means that we need to actually be brave enough to come, come out, 
be talking be talking openly about our um, our issues and both our strengths and our weaknesses. I'm quite happy to tell people about the areas that I'm weak in because I'm now confident enough to be able to know that I'm strong in other areas, that I see things differently, that I can think strategically, whatever. Um, but it requires mentoring and, and, and it's incumbent upon the older generation of people with disabilities and in the profession to pass on those skills, that knowledge and that confidence mm -hmm. to the next generation. And that's why it's really important the work that you're doing because you're, you're, you're building that skills, skill set and also the setting people up to be successful and, and to be open and therefore hope, help, hopefully you know, moving the, the sort of societal exceptions forward. Because I think now, you know, as, as um, same-sex marriage is pretty much legal everywhere in the world, you wouldn't have thought that 15 years ago. I, I, it, it's moved really quickly. So as people um, create these movements, and, and we are part of a movement, I believe strongly that we are 100%. part of it. Yeah, that, that we must um, continue to advocate and continue to talk about and continue to be open about it so that we can create completely um, a, a cultural shift because that's what I think it requires. Anyway, I've, I've, too, I've taken up too much of your airtime here. So. Uh, I, I just want to add one point. Um, it's, it's funny you mentioned that, you know, what's the story? That got you into accessibility yeah. and um, many of my students in the educational support program they come to the program because uh, they've been touched by a story or for a passion that they have for accessibility and uh, I was having a conversation one time with a friend and we were talking about accessibility and ramps and design universal design and what have you and, uh, and she said you know I've got a friend of mine who um, she is extremely serious about accessibility because her dad is in a wheelchair. And, and I said, you know, that's amazing, but it's a shame. I think we all need to take accessibility as personal, right? We don't have to wait until our life is touched by a disability to take it personal. It is personal to me, right? Yeah, so um, I think if we don't talk about accessibility, we talk about the, um, you know, the stand back movement where I'm just going to stand and watch. You know, it's, it's beautiful that you talked about the movement and, uh, and shaking things up and, and uh, disruptive movements where, you know what, let's make some change. But I tell my students, you don't, it doesn't have to be something major. It could be a Facebook post on um, Word Autism Day, mm -hmm. right? It could be a tweet on, I saw this and I think this needs to be improved, right? It's little yeah. things and it could be as big as Access Chat. I think your group is doing an amazing, amazing work and I, and I love following the feed um, and I love the passion behind it. So I want to thank you for that. Honored to be here today. Thank you. I, I, think, I think you're right. Um, I'm, I'm not saying everyone should be like the three of us standing up proselytizing the whole time. I Please that, do. <laughs> uh, but well, it's, well, it's my job, it's my passion and, and also Deborah's and, and, and you know, I, I know that Antonio is very, you know, come, come to this through, through me but is equally passionate. Um, but I think you're right. It's in, each individual action helps add weight to that argument and the more people we can encourage to feel comfortable to do that, the better. Um, and, and, no, and no. One, yeah. but, but that's another point. It's not just that we need to talk that between ourselves. We need to no. join and talk with other communities. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. True, true, true. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, that's one of the rationales why we didn't turn this into, you know, WCAG chat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We also wanted people to join. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we're not we're not technocratic. It's about people. And, and I'm just kidding because we're both, Neil and I are both on uh, WCAG. Yeah, we've got we love them. Yeah, we've got 24 <laughs> minutes before we're due on a call. <laughs> and, it, and and it's a, and I think I'm reviewing a document about distractions, <laughs> which is which is pretty much my life online. Um, but so. Where do you see 
education going in terms of inclusion and, and accessibility? What what are the things that could be improved and, and, and what do you think is good right now? How much time do we have? Uh, That's going to be a <laughs> No. Um, I think, honestly, uh, that we've done, we've done a good job. Are we there yet? No, not yet. There needs to be uh, a lot done, but uh, I think we, we did really well when it came to uh, creating those uh, specialized services, right? Our students can go to schools with um, average students, right? Uh, but accessibility is not just about um, physical proximity or inclusion is not about just physical proximity, right? Inclusion is about uh, creating that sense of belonging and, and uh, um, making sure that, you know, UDL is being implemented in the classroom. So we, we've, I think we've done a good job, but there are a lot uh, to be done, more to be done. Okay. Yeah, I think, again, you're making a great point. Um, Kevin Carey, who's uh, chair of the RNIB, He's got a horrible term, but it's a great it's a great concept, and and that is about peer normative task completion. So mm -hmm. um, the, the idea that, that essentially you should be able to do something with the same ease that's equality. Um, it's it's not it's not every, everyone's different, and your ways of accessing may be different, but it's about this being able to do something as easily as the the rest of the population for Even sure differently and we have to keep in mind that fairness is not sameness right yeah. uh, many people confuse that and say well it's not fair to my other students well you know uh, different people need different things and this is why I love universal design for learning and differentiated instruction where it speaks to every uh, learner in the classroom and you're you're meeting their needs I'm stealing a quote. I know all the. I know. I was. I was just going <laughs> to tweet that too. That's excellent. Fairness is not. Sense. It's not mine. I don't take credit for it, but uh, I've uh, I've read it somewhere, and I just it spoke too much to me. It's, fairness is not saying it's so true, right? Yeah. yeah, that's a great saying. Yeah, it really is. Love that. So, um, one of the, one of the things that I see in I, I worked in, in the education sector for quite a long time, providing assistive tech to students. Um, and one of the big surprises to me was moving into enterprise and working for an enormous big company and finding out how difficult it was to deliver um, accessibility in, in that sense because of a lockdown nature um, of, of the systems that we, we provide. That's changing, but how is the provision put in place in, in the universities? Because individual students in the UK got their own computer, they got the assistive tech put on there. Now that doesn't mean that the, the university systems are accessible or whatever, but they're kings of their own castle, as it were. That, you know, they have admin rights, they can do whatever they like with the machine, that means that the AT is easier to run, etc. Who provides that kit? Is it the universities or do they have to go out and buy it themselves? How does the system work? Um, so again, it goes back to the psychoeducational assessment and the individual needs of the students. Um, the program that I'm in, it's a mobile computing program. And at uh, my college, we have a lot of mobile computing programs where students are required to bring their own laptops with them. That being said, if they, um, if they do have uh, an identified disability and uh, they have an updated psychoeducational assessment, then they are eligible for assistive technology. And, and keep in mind, income plays a role in all that kind of stuff, right? But there are available services for students where uh, they work with, assistive, with an assistive technologist and, and they can load specific programs on their computers, such as Kurzweil, Dragon, um, uh, JAWS, different programs based on their needs and based on their accommodation form. So it, uh, there's a system for it in place. Does that answer your question, Neil? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. But, but, um, no, it's an investment. So when they are buy, when they need to buy a laptop or a phone, 
is an investment for the families. Is any uh, any type of support that is provided to them to make sure that they are making able to make the right choice? Okay, so um, to answer your question without confusing you, it's a bit complicated. So, <laughs> if the program um, requires a laptop, then the students, all students, are required to bring a laptop, right? But if the program in um, I've been out of accessible learning for four years now so uh, I want to make sure that I give you the right information but as far as I remember if the program does not require a laptop and uh, a laptop is required to make uh, the learning of that student successful then there's a birth story for it uh, but when it comes to assistive technology those those programs are required to make learning more accessible for students Right? And then uh, based on the bursary and the psych assessment and accommodation form, the assistive technologist would be able to add those programs. But it's, it's a bit complicated with funding and policies and, and whatnot. But to answer your question, yes, there are programs available. There is support available. Um, and, uh, and students learn to navigate through the system. We have an amazing accessible learning services office. And um, people there try to provide uh, students with the best things uh, they can provide to make their learning and le learning journey successful, I should say. Because um, student success, I believe student success is not just about an academic one it's about a social one an emotional one and uh, and an academic one so um, I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> we want to produce rounded individuals yes so yes absolutely 100 percent. excellent so i think we've just about reached the end of our half hour so thank you so much thank you it's been thank you really interesting chatting with you um, you. look forward to joining you on Twitter tomorrow night yes honored to be here keep up the good fight uh, and um, you guys are amazing you're awesome thank so. you Damon. thanks cut <laughs>